Number five, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only five Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, and 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community and be entered into our monthly giveaways and, of course, private content just for Patreon supporters. Again, we're only five, five Patreon supporters away from this major milestone. For more information, check the link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are here on June 24th, and Jesus, it was a hot one. I think it was like 104 degrees. I know I 100% got heat stroke <laughs> fishing the Battle of Five Lakes on Saturday. I drank a gallon of water, and I still stopped pissing by noon, and that was not good. So, but it, hey, they, they absolutely caught them there. Uh, you know, huge shout out to everyone that actually braved the weather to get out there. All the lakes showed out, and that was absolutely fun. Fishing in this heat, is extremely difficult and most anglers basically call it quits until really the fall but you do get some diehards out here and especially this guy who is a fan favorite who comes from the great mystical land of roanoke and smith mountain lake the man the myth the legend billy coles billy how are you doing tonight what's up buddy how are you i'm staying alive in this absolute heat wave we've gotten yeah we need some rain brother my uh i've got dirt uh for a yard basically at this point so i don't have to pay the the yard guys which is which is a nice little uh nice little savings but i tried watering the yard like i don't know four or five times and it's just nope not happening so how bad is the lake right now actually the lake is actually pretty full um very clear though um there's not stained water really anywhere we're getting a little bit on the weekends just from the wake um kind of like busting up on the bank and stuff like that, but it's, it's gone Monday morning, but it's probably 14 foot clear, um, which is making, which is making fishing, uh, ultra fun. Definitely having to stay really far away. I've got live scopes at over a hundred feet right now and, uh, making super long casts and, uh, they're not biting for a super long time on each school. You got to rotate quite a bit, which we'll, t- we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, but I don't think the lake's very low. They've been generating, you know, for the heat wave and everything. So, um but no it's going good man it's going good i'm excited to be on a live well speaking of live scope uh i know this broke two weeks ago that they decided again i think this is part two of do people actually hate live scope or they bitch about it on facebook and they created a new gunnersville no live scope tournament like what what are your thoughts on that um you know, we bri- you and me briefly chatted about it. I love live scope. It's a tool. You can't make them bite. There's a hundred different reasons why it's good. There's definitely some reasons that it's bad. Is it taking kind of that like, you know, mystery out of fishing? Sure it is, but it's also making a lot of us better anglers. I don't think the fish are getting that conditioned. It's It feels like a regular year to me where I'm having to adjust bait colors, bait sizes. But once you get that locked in, they're still biting. So it's I don't think it's impacting the fishery um, as much. I know on the other live that that I uh, chimed in on when we were driving to the beach, you were talking about that study um, that it didn't really change that much. I didn't look up anything past that, but basically, I don't really see an impact on that. And then I do, I do think it's pretty funny that they they chose Gunnersville in the fall as a no live scope tournament because Gunnersville in the fall is frog 101 mm-hmm. um you wouldn't need live scope anyways you're gonna go th- throw a frog under uh, or over the mats and that's gonna be probably how it gets won um we'll see if people show up um you know i've i've messaged it to a few guys that fished opens and stuff like that and there's nobody that's messaging me back like oh yeah like this is the future i'm gonna go yeah. and and anything like that so we'll see you know it seems like there's 
a little bit of traction with getting it either it's never going to be banned. Let's be completely honest with yeah. that. It's never going to be banned. There's too much money in it, but there's definitely it feels like maybe a little bit of traction of some of the ones like Bass and MLF, maybe um, dialing it back a little bit as far as numbers of graphs, numbers of transducers and, and um, maybe that route, but I don't think it's ever going to go. So we'll, we'll see what, what is the, I don't even know. I, I briefly looked at it since we were at the beach. What's the entry fee on that bad boy? Uh, the entry fee, I think, is still to be announced. I think it was, I thought it was like 500 bucks. Let me let me double check with some friends. I, the biggest thing that I know from it is it's all dependent on a full field that it would be half a million dollars. So gotcha. that was that was low in the fine print there that they have to draw a full field, which I just don't think they will. I which think is what, 2,000 boats? <laughs> it's, it's some asinine number. And again, it gets down to like the economy sucks. People sucks. are selling their boats. And I just, I think there's too yep. many, yeah. And we, that could be a whole other conversation. I, I do think what is interesting is how much of it is where you fish. The last two big events that you've seen on TV, you saw, you know, Mr. Cox and one of them with a frog and Jordan Lee. And it's, if you pick events that you actually give shallow water anglers an advantage, it's fine. Yep. But if you're going to Lake Fork in February or the St. Lawrence, no shit. Like, yeah. it, like it's not complicated. Yep. Yeah. And, Unfortunately, I'm, I mean, I just had a trip this morning with two uh, older gen gentlemen. They're in their 80s, and we were talking about um, competitive fishing. Obviously, they grew up in an era with flashers and, you know, fish in Bugs Island and, and kind of the, the red mans and stuff like that, where they don't, you know, they're like, MLF's boring and bass doesn't really do much for me. And, these, and one of the guy in the back of the boat was like, they go to the same place every time. It's so the yeah. same time, in the same 30 day window. And he, he honestly, he, he was pretty harsh about it. He's like, these guys think they're crazy good anglers because they can catch more than 20 pounds, but they're at pre-spawn lakes the majority of the time or like very fresh post-spawn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, he was, he was like, he was lighting it up pretty good um, in, in kind of how he was wording it. But, you know, I don't know. That's, that's a, that's a different generation of people too, um, that just grew up doing it a different way. But I, I do wonder if they'll get a full field, if it's $500 entry fee and that is the winnings, I maybe could see that just cause it's, you know, what is that? A third of the cost of an open, um, it's going to probably fish pretty good. Um, just cause it's Gunnersville in the fall and, I know maybe they get enough, but depending on what a, what a true full field is. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're right. The economy definitely is, uh, I'm definitely having the slowest guiding year that I've, I've had, um, still good, but it, something's definitely up. I, I don't think there's a way to look around that at yeah, this point. But Ma Matthew's coming in hot with the hot take. So the stocks are still up. So clearly everything's fine right now. So yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Matthew. Let's um, say it for all the people in the back, the stock market doesn't dictate <laughs> the economy. <laughs> Yes, so. that's that's uh, that's 100 percent factual. Bassmaster did come out last week and said that for next year, there is going to be a 60 inch limit on screen sizes, which they did. OK, sweet. I ain't too good on math, but that's still a shitload of screen. Sizes. It's still five screens, isn't it? Yeah, it's five screens. You can still have your 25 inch plasma screen up front. So it was the, the safest thing they could do without getting people mad at them. What about transducers? I know a lot of guys are running live scope on the back. They haven't said anything yet, but again, a friend of mine in the industry said like, okay, they put a rule in and then Garmin will come out with an all in one Swiss army knife transducer that can do everything. So, you know, screw you bass. Like, yeah, like, he's not wrong. Like, sure. It's not going to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Um, yeah, they probably, I mean, I don't know. I think five graphs is, I don't even understand. Yeah, I don't even understand. I guess maybe I don't fish lakes that are pressured enough, but I feel like Smith Mountain Lake is pretty pressured. Um, but it does not take five graphs to catch bass. Um, well, so. I'll also give a, a plug to your boat because I think there's two options you go with, which is you do get a bigger screen because I've been on a yep. guy's boat that has an N, NBT acronym, whatever the hell that thing is. Yep. I get it. It's so much easier to see shit. Or that new mount that you bought for the front of your boat. Yep which is a great little way to go too. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm not affiliated with them at all. I just finally was like, dude, I'm spending a lot of money going to the chiropractor. Um, <laughs> and, um, my chiropractor is real funny. Like I come in, he's like, dude, you are super messed up. Um, so I got the beat down, um, with the extender. It comes up like it's three and a half feet, I think on the full extension, um, which I'm probably not going to use that 
for the next two, three months, just with the, the wakes. I mean, you don't, you wouldn't want to run it at, at the clock <laughs> yeah. anyways, being fulcrum like that, but, um, winter time, dude, Demiki fishing is what kills your back and your neck and mm -hmm. your shoulders and your foot, um, on the trolling motor. So yeah, I bought a, I bought kind of like a better backrest seat. And then I think I'll raise that up for winter fishing. Um, but even I did a four inch plate or a four inch bridge to the actual like mount that it's on. So I'm up another, like I'm already up almost two feet. Um, and that I can already tell in like four or five days of fishing, or I guess even what is it? Two or three days of fishing. Um, I'm already feeling a little bit better. Nice. So, um, yeah, that should hopefully help. Not the cheapest mount, definitely well-made. I will say that it's, it's a, it's a beefy one. And then I've been running, I've been running with it on that four inch bridge at the height that it's at, at Smith mountain on the weekend. I don't go, you know, I'm not, you know, balls to the wall during the summertime, but I'm going 45, 55 miles an hour. Um, and I haven't had any like weird shake to it where I'm like, Oh my God, it's gonna, it's gonna come off and hit me in the face. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, but yeah, that's, that's the other side too, is like, do you go with a 25 inch screen or do you go with, you know, I, I do, I do think, and I recommend this to clients all the time when I do electronics training, like at least get a 10 inch screen yeah. processors different. It's going to make it easier. It's going to be faster. Like that is the up upgrade I would make is don't go with the seven or a nine, go with a 10 or a 12. Um, but a 12, you know, quote at my young age, um, a 12 raised up is, is still solid. So every inch guys you get a bigger monitor the more spoiled you get you can't go back i'm just telling you right yeah. now i have uh i have 360 on a 15 inch and i could never go back to a 12 so yeah just be forewarned there yeah um is there any tournaments coming up on smith mountain lake so summertime's interesting um and we should talk about this a little bit with with fish care coming up because um there's definitely tournaments where we're unfortunately seeing uh fish fatalities just it is kind of part of the game. There's a few things that I personally want to talk about that I think can, that I think are happening that, uh, that kind of get under my skin a little bit, but, um, we have a Tuesday nighter and Friday nighter, Saturday nighters. That's like the local boys. That's the good old boys catching big ones. I don't know if you saw it. I think it was two Saturdays ago. Somebody caught a nine eighty um, on a Saturday. Yep. Um, and there's definitely sixes and sevens getting weighed every, um, every Tuesday, Friday and Saturday. So that's, that's pretty impressive. So that's, if you think back on Smith, just kind of divert real quick, I think since last October, that's the fourth fish over nine pounds since last October. And they just restocked F ones again yeah. a they week just, ago. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So they just restocked at Dwayne's, um, about a week ago. And I don't know if you saw his, um, saw his post also about the the growth rate we can talk about that in a second but back to tournaments real quick so that that's like the local stuff thursdays is usa bassin and all these tournaments are either 6 30 to 10 30 or late into the night like eight to two in the morning um, i don't really fish them because i got to get up early the next day plus i had a bad scare with a probably drunk pontoon person the first year i lived here oh, um, in the middle of the night and i'm just not gonna kill myself to chase some bass at night so uh, I don't really do the night stuff that much, but the other tr summer trail that's, that's coming out. Um, and then one bigger one that we should talk about. The other summer one is the Liberty, uh, fishing team, which, you know, you've had Liberty guys on here before, and they're, they're really big into the bass fishing, um, scene. They're doing a summer trail for kind of raising money for their fishing team. So I think they've got three or four in the summer, a few in the fall, a few in the late fall, um, that are going to be pretty fun, low entries. Hmm. I think it's like a 80, 20 payback or something like that. Um, so that'll be a good little one, but the more important one that we should talk about, which we can also divert and talk about BFL stuff if you want and all of that jazz. But, um, one trail I'm super, super excited about would love to be on here again to just kind of chat about it is the Bass King solo trail. Um, which is part of the the cat trail system is going to kick off this year um, as kind of a test year, but it's a higher entry fee solo trail, um, bigger side pots, uh, membership fee, kind of similar to an MLF setup as far as what you're paying to get in. Um, but the payouts are looking like they're going to be better. 
it's a solo trail. Um, they're still going to do lie, de lie detector tests just to make sure we don't have any, any cheaters going on. But um, I'm really leaning towards and getting excited about doing that trail um, from the perspective of um, I can kind of pick where I want to go the whole day. I don't know if we've talked since the, the last BFL, but I always get this weird deal when I fish BFLs that if the co-angler has zeros and I've got 16, 17 pounds I'm, and it's four hours left, I'm like, let's go catch him a couple fish and I waste like an hour of time. Mm -hmm. um, probably when I could get a key bite, but um, that solo trail sounds like it's going to be pretty good. And it's actually Smith Mountain Lake and Bugs. So okay. it's going to be a split to where I don't think anybody's really going to just take the points away. Like this is actually going to show what I think is a better way to do tournaments, which is this year, I think we've got six or seven events. I'd have to look it up exactly. But next year, if, if this year goes well, I think they're planning on doing nine events over 12 months and they're spreading it out for the entire year. So if you're an angler that gets annoyed that, you know, there's, 15 names in the BFLs that always are up in the points because it's February, March, April, and they're really good springtime fishermen. But after that, they kind of fall off. Um, this trail could be something that maybe interests you. I personally love when we have grimy tournaments because I think that's what actually makes fishing a little bit more fun is going out there and trying to break down grimy water, turnover water, Mm -hmm. boat traffic like with finding bigger schools not just two pound school you know two pound um schooling fish and stuff like that so for that trail i'm just gonna pull my phone up i think i took a screenshot so yeah for this year they've got august 25th at sml september 8th at smith Mount, at sml october 6th is going to be at bugs out of ivy october 20th out of ivy November 10th out of Smith Mountain State Park and December 8th championship at Bugs um, out of Ivy. So it's $200 entry fee. Uh, membership's 50 bucks. There's two optional side pots. Um, fish two events to make the championship. And then it sounds like they're going to swap these it, next year. They'll swap the tournaments back and forth between Smith Mountain and Bugs. And then the championship will be at Smith. But I think it's going to be a cool year um to just see who decides to fish all of them and how the points kind of end up um seeing all the different months that you have to fish you have to be way more versatile of an angler uh to probably do super well so it looks like an interesting trail it looks like good payouts similar to the bfl if not better based on now nowhere near as many boats um so i think that's a that's another draws you're not having to beat 200 guys to make six grand you could mm -hmm. maybe be going out against 80 um and doing it so we'll see but that is that is one of the tournaments that uh definitely i am super interested in in being a part of so it cat has really blown up in the last couple of years i remember well, before COVID, honestly and i kind of heard of them but it's just every year they just gain more and more steam yep and i mean they're south carolina north carolina and virginia yeah. um and they're yeah, they, they run a really good team trail. Kevin Dawson's our tournament director here. He's fishes the tournaments. He's involved in the community all the time. Like him and his brother, Joey are solid, like just fishing community guys. Um, and it's just a good group of guys that, that fish them. So they're just trying to do it at a good pace. It doesn't need to get launched crazy fast and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I mean, dude, Smith mountain late August and early September, September 8th is probably one of the worst weeks of fishing at Smith mountain or not worse, but like tough. Um, so I'm super interested in that tournament to kind of see how people approach that and, and how you would approach it to, to come in with a bag on, on those kinds of days. Yeah. We, we have so many freaking, uh, questions already pouring in. Uh, let's see, here's a fun one here. Oh, where is it? Uh, Matthew says do a tournament on the upper bay for a grinder. That's a different type <laughs> of grinder boss. Um, Nick, uh, is, is nighttime the only time you can get them on Smith in the summer kind of sucks. I could be on the Potomac at 2 PM, 104, catch them. So that's also Nick, the difference between a lake and a river and also grass, grass lakes do fish differently. Yep. Yeah, they've got a lot more cover to hide in, um, and there's definitely cooler water in that grass. But Nick, I will tell you, man, this is this. 
So I, this is my fourth year guiding. Um, my last two Augusts were killer good. My, my, my two biggest guide fish ever, which I will say both of them got off right at the boat just because the guys just didn't get a good hook in them. But both of those fish, I'm pretty sure were close to 10 pounds. Though They were in August, a week and a half apart off the same rock pile and like 20 feet on a shaky head at like 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Like the most so non-typical, like what the hell yeah. is going on um, type of fish. But we we are definitely seeing a change in Smith Mountain. So so why don't we, why don't we bring this up? Um, so Dwayne posted about the F ones, and there's definitely been talk about Smith Mountain since I've lived here, probably well before that. Is this turning into a blueback lake? Um, and that gets discussed all the time. I take calls from it all the time. I talk to striper guides all the time from it. The the data that is looking like on the F ones is they are growing insanely fast they yeah. are populating fast and i yeah. think on on Dwayne's post was that four years ago when they fin clipped all of our tournament fish nine percent of those fish were f1s this year 28 percent of the fish over four pounds are f1s in yeah. four years and if you guys go back into some of those shows, I just I said that the bluebacks will take over, and it reminds me a lot of like a Lake Murray vibe here, where you have a yep. dominant largemouth strain, and you have a forage that they can just pack on the weight. Yes, and uh, I just did my Instagram post for the day from the trip this morning. What's different than any of the other years, um, Nick, that I have fished is my bass schools on my schooling spots are huge this year. Like normally Smith Mountain doesn't set up like a TVA or like a Hartwell or nothing like that. It's usually like six, eight, maybe 10 bass together. I counted 30 bass in this school that we were fishing this morning in like 14 feet of water off of a point. And there we went back to it four or five times. Every single time when they got a fish hooked up and pulled it back, there was eight or 10 fish following them back, just like blueback eaters do. Um, and those fish aren't going to go anywhere for the next two months. Mm. There's no reason. There's so much bait right now um, on these points. They're definitely eating a lot of it. Um, like my boat is c covered in shad shit. It's disgusting. Because <laughs> um, every time you pull one up, it's just, it's so full. Um, but summertime at Smith is actually setting up to be pretty good and consistent, which is, which is strange to say, even in the boat traffic, um, it's really not taken a hit. Um, and then on top of that, going back to the F ones is if that's the caliber of fish that are going to be F ones, the other thing that I'm noticing is they actually eat when it's balls hot mm -hmm. and like, that's that Florida drama queen coming out where it's like, they want low or they want high pressure, low wind bluebird mm -hmm. skies. And you're catching them on top water in August at like three in the afternoon. Um, so it's, it's just changing pretty quick to what is a consistent bite in the summer. And and that was my other thing I wanted to add to it. Are you going to be seeing a top water bite that you see on the vaunted blueback lakes like Murray, Hartwell, Kiwi, things like that? Yeah. I mean, I have a couple baits that are kind of like top water ish related. Um, so we can, we can definitely jump into that stuff too. But yeah, I do think September gets iffy. Um, July for sure. Uh, th again, like I just remember you and me talking in the spring, like we've had a weird ass year. It's been weird, it, super weird year of up and down 10 degrees here, 10 degrees down, 10 degrees up spawning, not spawning, spawning late. Um, so I think we're late to the schooling game, which is going to extend, I think with, um, with where it's going to be. But yeah, I do think with the clarity with how many bass i'm seeing in schools there's no reason there wouldn't be a top water bite um for them to go and for anybody that hasn't been to smith mountain before there's treetops in this lake that you can put the boat in 70 feet and the trees are 50 feet tall and the bait is 12 feet suspended over a treetop in 20 and you can pull bass out of those trees on a top water in the middle of mm -hmm. nowhere like you look like you are lost or your boat is broken um, and you can pull a, a pencil popper or a walking bait or a fluke or anything over the top of those fish. And those bass will come out of 20 feet and crush um, even in the middle of the day. So it takes a long time to find those areas, but 
that is a pattern that that is, I think, going to be consistent at Smith from here on out. When do you think the dirty 30s will become regular at Smith? So that's that's, you know, I mentioned the nine pounders or whatever. Um, I'm surprised nobody's weighed in a 10 pounder yet. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's got a striper guides for sure. They catch them all the time. Really? Uh, I, yeah, dude. I see old timers with like two teeth at the gas station smoking two cigarettes that are like, look at this big bass I caught the other day. And it's like a legit 12 pounder. And I'm like, oh, what are you fishing with? They're like 10 inch gizzard shad and 90 feet by the dam. Um, like you'll, you'd never be able to catch that fish. But I definitely have seen on phones multiple times from striper guys that have 10 pounders. Some of the striper guides post them sometimes in the fall. Like, hey, caught another trash fish. It's like a almost 11 pounder. Um, I think next spring could definitely be close. We've had three or four that are upper nines, like not, you know, they just need to be a little bit more pre-spawn um, to, to be right at that 10 mark. Uh, so I think dirty 30s close. I know Chad. Giving him a second here. Where'd I go? see if he comes back. Uh, there he is. Chad. You know, they, you're talking to Chad. Yeah, Chad and Johnny had a 29 or 20, 28 or 29 pound bag with an eight. Well, mm. if one of their fives turns into a seven, which that's not, it's hard, but it's not that impossible. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we're a couple years off from it happening and um, it definitely will be a springtime deal. It has to be pre-spawn. We don't have, I don't think we have any like super post spawny fish that are that size, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of like going back through some of the data here because like the Piedmont division was 24 pounds mm -hmm. uh, to, to win it. And then the Shenandoah division, because I should have had yeah, this Brummett, Brummett had, uh, Chris Brummett had like 28. 28, yeah, 27.09. Like, so that's so damn cool. That, you're right. So it's close, so dude. freaking close. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I think he had an eight something. So uh, again, it's literally a four pounder turning into a six or a five turning into a seven or two fours turning into two sixes. Um, which, you know, I, my biggest bag here is 27, 10, and we had a three pounder that we could not pull. Jesus. And we had, we had three bites that came off that I think would have put us really close to 30. Um, so I think it, I'm sure someone hasn't posted or an old timer or whatever has definitely, definitely happened. Um, uh, but as far as in a tournament after tournament pressure and stuff, I still think we're a couple years away. Um, but it's close we've we've talked when I when I when I went down to Smith this spring about the smallmouth fishing how do you think the blueback are going to affect them going forward ghosts buddy it's like chasing it's like chasing ghosts we're catching I'm catching maybe like one or two a trip um but I think I've brought this story up before the one of the weirdest things I've had happen on this lake was coming back in September like two years ago full speed trimmed up like full like got to get home and fish started blowing up in front of me over like 120 feet in the middle of the river channel. And I drove right through them being like, let's see what they are. And they were all smallmouth. It looked like striper blowing up. It had to be 80 fish. Turn the boat around, get up in there, grab like, I don't even know what I grabbed, but some sort of like topwater deal. They blew up for another like 15 seconds, but all of them were brown. Um, and it That's was like insane. the most impressive thing I've seen. I've gone back there a hundred times. There's nothing there. Um, it's literally, it was just a river channel and it was just the biggest school of smallmouth I've ever seen. Um, the years go in waves, man. Last year, I actually did catch smallmouth well into August, like th three pounders. Um, but most times once July hits, they're gone. They're just ghosts. They'll come back in September, October and, I think they're just out chasing bluebacks, being sight, you know, sight vision eaters, and they're over those treetops chasing bluebacks. So they're pretty, they're pretty hard to target. That's that's exciting news for the lake, though. That really is as as it evolves and grows. Um, yeah, huge shout out to the state for for also just continuing the F one program because that has definitely. It's remarkable to see what this lake has become. And you can, again, guys, go go back to the BFL stats since like 13, 15, something around there, and you can just track the uptick of the weights. It's insane to see that it's working. It really is. Yeah. 
and honestly, I think a lot of the other lakes, like Norman, I don't know if they're doing it at Bugs yet, Anna, I think they're using Smith Mountain as their case study. Now the they are 100%. Like, look, yeah. at, look at how Smith Mountain's doing and look at these samples. Um, and I think that is getting funding for a lot of these other yeah. recreational slash fishing lakes. Um, like Norman, dude, I, I would love Norman to get mm-hmm. to start growing big, big largemouth um, and kind of pushing the spots out a little bit because that lake annoys the piss out of me. But um, <laughs> if you want to go burn through a hundred dollars in robo worms, go to Norman um, and you'll have seven pounds. It, so it's, it's so weird because you mentioned Kerr. I just wonder as long as they keep adjusting the water levels, if that place will ever fish good because it's such a massive lake for, I don't know if there's not enough fish in the population or they just need to stock the living shit out of it. Dude, I think so. You, you know me, I'm not a massive fan of bugs just cause I just haven't, I've never done well. I've dropped two giant ones in tournaments there. Like it just doesn't fish to my strengths. It's too big for me. And the flip, the, the whole like, Hey man, it's up in the bushes. Go flip the bushes. I flipped all the bushes, bro. Like <laughs> I flipped them all and there's not that many fish in the bushes. Um, so I think from, from things that I have learned from guys like sticks on bugs is the catfish population is out of control really? to where they think it's just decimating. You know, we all know as, as fishermen, catfish are super aggressive. Oh, God, I catch yeah. my crank baits more than any other bait. Like they're aggressive eaters um is i was taught that you can take like if you can't tell the difference because catfish and bass kind of swim the same on live scope there's and and in schools you wouldn't be able to really tell Mm -hmm. the difference is if you're practicing in a tournament and you think you're on a megawatt of of hump you know fish drop a gulp minnow down there take a three inch gulp minnow drop it down there you're going to get plunked right away if it's catfish and all of them are catfish and move on to the next spot um, so I, I don't know that place. It, I just, I don't enjoy going there. I can't wait for the day when I crack the code, um, and just kind of mentally can break over that like 12 pound range. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope they do F ones in there. The other thing that I thought they were doing at bugs, I feel like I saw this years ago was they were implanting that like water grass or that like asparagus grass or whatever the hell that project was <laughs> where, Maybe you could go toss a frog around or, you know, a popper type of type of deal or something like that. Yeah. Or even a swim jig would be nice. I interviewed last summer the, the head of the Army Corps of Engineers and they are doing that, but they're also putting in a hundred tons of grass carp each year to control the mm. hydrilla, which eats Sweet. the water cellar that they're putting in. So Sweet. I don't understand that decision yeah. at all. Um, but people have this weird ass thing that hydrilla is worse than Hamas and it must yeah. be killed. And it yeah. just is so counterintuitive because good Lord, if freaking Smith had water willow or, or hydrilla, geez, we do have, dude, we have a time. We have some patches of that water willow. This I've got a mark. There's like eight patches. It's like bluegill brim spots. So it's super mm. nice because those spots usually will have bass for sure, but it's like seven spots on the whole lake. Um, are homeowners so, associations bitchy about that stuff or are they okay with the water willow? It's, I mean, dude, it's not even the size of the front of the deck of your boat. It's oh. probably 30 stems together. Like it's, it's like all five right. feet, five feet long or whatever. But how about we all, as your listeners, just get bow and arrows and go kill all the carp that are in Bugs Island and I'm everyone not- should just go catfishing for two years and then Bugs Island would be awesome. I'm not going to condone it, but I will approve of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, because yeah, that's the thing that helped Lake Anna out just on a side tangent is when all the grass carp died from the early two thousands on water willow came back and the lake is covered in water willow. And all of a sudden there's shocking. There's a fantastic shallow water bite there in the summertime yeah. now. And it's because of that SAV. Yeah. Um, um, Gaston, I feel like it's the same. We shot, a, I've never fished Gaston, but we shot a couple weddings there. I feel like, uh, when I flew the drone around, it was like every point that had kind of like a retaining wall or something to it had, had that grass to it. That place is weird because I don't know why bigger, it's not that, it's not, it's pretty big, right? I mean, I don't know why there's not more tournaments there. It looked big, but (laughs) another spot lake. Yeah. So bait wise, as as everyone in the comment section is flooding with questions here, um, I mean, what do you got to, what are you usually throwing this time of year? And then also I'll, I'll add to that. Is there any difference between what you would throw in the day versus night if you decided to go back out at night? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a difference in that and we can talk. So, 
Um, we'll jump into the baits, but but I want to preface this with we are talking finesse. So there is summertime big bait fishing. Um, that's definitely a thing. A big worm is like a staple for summertime fishing. I'm still catching fish on glide baits. Um, you can still throw a jig on deeper rocks. Like all of that stuff is is still there. For me though, as a northerner, spinning rod kind of guy, guiding, I have to be a little bit more geared towards getting people bites um, and, and just trying to put fish in the boat. So I rely heavily on finesse tactics. So a couple of these, I feel like everybody probably knows and throws. They're a little bit unique um, with like the sizes. And then there's, um, there's one on here that I think is a little bit, a little bit sneaky that I'll share. That's a Northern Minnesota deal. Um, but I'm really focused right now on paying attention to how they're set up, where they are on the points, whether that's up on the flat, off on the deep side, suspended or tight to the bottom. Um, and then I'm really focused on watercolor. So if for some reason we're supposed to get a wet summer, that's what they said, right? <laughs> um, if we start getting that rain and the water gets stained, you can probably start upsizing your baits again. Um, but right now is that transition time where a lot of this bait's getting crushed. We did have a lot of bait left over from the winter and all of a sudden we're going to start seeing where they're chasing smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller bait to where when we get into August and September, they are literally chasing bait that's like this big. Um, and that's just the progression of where the bigger bait goes down super deep into the thermocline um, and kind of how Smith Mountain sets up. I call them, I don't, I don't know if they're thread fins. I don't know what I, what they are, but I call them ghost minnows. They're little like yeah. 2.8 silvery minnows that you would use for like a crappie. There's usually a ton of them together. Um, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to show you guys on presenting on top of that, this lake does get a lot of pressure as well as a lot of these lakes do. So downsizing in general is a good idea to get more bites. Most dudes are going to throw a regular fluke. They're going to throw a walk-in bait. They're going to throw a three, three Kai tech. Like they're going to throw that middle of the road standard. It does get bites, but if you want to put more bites in and if you want to match the hatch better and potentially trick a big one, um, these are the baits and you can catch giant ones on these. I do it all the time. Has, has yeah. BFS culture helped match the hatch with the smaller stuff? So I haven't gotten into the, the setups yet on it for bait casters. Um, you know, I'm a big spinning rod guy, like I just said, and then I've got like my arsenal of spinning rods goes from a seven foot zero power to seven, nine, two power rods. Like I've got the whole gambit in between that. And I do think there's, there's benefits to, to each of those rods. Um, I think the BFS like top water thing could probably be uh, yeah. the deal, like a two inch popper or like a really tiny walking bait um could definitely be could definitely be something that could play um out on schoolers for sure i just haven't done it yet i have too many fishing poles already bro <laughs> um yeah, i haven't even looked by making bass i really want to try they came out with some like little bfs walker that i really do want to try someday yeah that mega bass definitely has some some japanese stuff coming that's um that's really tiny and unique too um just because again, it goes back to J Japanese culture. They're all shore fit, you know, they're off the bank, they're in the woods, they're fishing streams, like all that sort of stuff. So, um, but jumping into the baits, uh, these are all shad imitators, I will say too. So you don't have to only throw shad. We just got over a full moon. Like I said, you could still throw a jig, you could still throw a shaky head, you could still throw a micro jig, stuff like that. But for me right now, shad is king. There's still a lot and um, this is kind of what we go with. So first, this is a super straightforward one. Like I mentioned, most dudes are probably going to throw a three, three, but what I have clients throw is this little has dong shad on a, uh, a Rashi head with the old, um, prop on here. So a couple different things with this, and this is a really, really good color with this clear water that we're having right now. So something that's super, super translucent. I like the has dong more than the spark shad right now because of that tail right there. Mm. it's really really important in the summertime for speed that's like top thing you should pay attention to is am i reeling too slow am i reeling too fast is the bait moving enough because you guys have to remember we're talking fish have you know they're cold-blooded so their metabolism is the fastest it is going to be all year long for the next two months they 
are super aggressive when you can get them going. Speed is important, so always remember that. And uh, I'll even have clients do stuff like reel this right under the surface. You know, we'll drop it down into suspended schools and stuff like that, but putting this right up on the surface can be really good so that they're looking up and they don't have a ton of water. Um, they kind of use that as, a, as an ambush spot, but throwing this on again, like a 7.3, rod you can bomb this thing a mile um these translucent colors are super super good and then the head obviously or the okashira um i don't know what i what i say a rashi head um the okashira head with that spy bait kind of approach to it it's just different it's something that, that feels different yeah eighth ounce for sure um on fall rate that can be the other thing that's really really important mm -hmm. so early morning we like a slower fall rate um they don't have as much light to see it, you know, you can present something that's kind of got that fluttery, like fallen down type of approach to, uh, to them. So you'll have a lot of fish pick this up on a pendulum is what we call it. You cast out, you let your slack line pendulum down through them. You don't even engage your reel at all. Um, and you just kind of lift up and they'll be there. That is, that's definitely a way to do it. But, um, so speed, check out these, um, good, good little shad imitating bait. And like I said, that, uh, that Okashira head with that, with that prop is just nasty, dude. It's just such a cool little bait. So, um, next everyone knows what a fluke is blueback. Like this is, pr this should probably be considered one of the like top five baits of all time. Um, it can be fished 12 months out of the year. It's really, really good to use. But what I do that's a little bit specific this time of year is I actually throw it weighted. So hmm. I want to have something going back to speed. I can work this thing on the top like a regular fluke. I just have to work it really fast. It'll stay down. But if I want this thing to nosedive through a school and not give them a good look at it, that is what's going to get a ton of reaction bites. 99% of people aren't going to throw it weighted. They're just going to think that, oh, I can get it in the school and create enough motion and them getting going. But you have to try to present something that might be a little bit different to them. Since you're over open water, mm -hmm. what is the pro of, of rigging it that way, Texas rig versus like with a straight shank hook or a jig hook so you could have that open hook on them? Yep, I do both. Um, so you could do exposed on that. I just have this rigged from, from just the other day. The other reason that I like doing this is if they are down on the bottom on the point. So uh, you can drag this thing, you know, just like you would a Texas rig if they're for some reason setting up in the morning where they're down tight. Um, maybe it's a pressure change or moonrise or something like that is you can take this and drag it, um, using a spinning rod and just kind of dragging it through the rocks. So the open hook thing, dude, probably, probably half of the time it's an open hook for me just cause it's easy with guiding. Mm. It, it's, you barely even have to set the hook with how hard they're going to hit a fluke this time of year. Um, so the other thing is this is not a full size fluke. Um, hmm. if you guys notice, this is a, this is the old, what is it? Teeny or junior? I don't yeah, know. the this, four inch. Think, yeah, so this would be junior, um, not the teeny. You could rig a teeny. This is just a little one aught, uh, one aught gamagatsu uh, worm hook. But that right there is just straight fish catcher, um, and adding that weight is just going to present it different than what most of the other guys are doing in it. And it's, uh, you know, I'll even go up in this weight size um to really make this thing fall like a rock you you really don't in the clear water you do not want these fish to get a great look at your bait they're getting pressure all the time on top of competition um you know amongst themselves you want something that's coming by them extremely fast that resembles a shad so that they don't get the time to process that they're getting casted at um and this, this would be another tip on the schooling stuff too you have to rotate um i deal with a lot of people that are like ah, we catch one fish but we can see them and there's a hundred, um, but we can only catch one fish and we sit there for two hours. Fish are not as dumb as we think they are, especially schoolers. I think it's a pheromone thing or like, honestly, they're probably pissing on the way in um, is I'm usually at Smith. I'm catching three max out of a school. I have to leave them for 10 minutes and come back for them to set up to be able to, to get them to eat. Is that with putting them in the live well or releasing them right back? Releasing them back. Okay. Yeah. Well, and the, the other side too is, so yeah, let's go both routes. If you throw them in the live ball, maybe you could catch more. Um, but releasing them back is the problem with schoolers is they're going to come to the boat. 
Yeah. If one of their buddies bites a bait and it's hanging out the side of their mouth and there's 30 of them together, they're all going, oh my God, Gary got one. Mm-hmm. Like, let's try to catch it. You'll have them fighting over these baits out of, they'll, they'll try to knock it out of each other's mouths. Um, so what sucks is on the schooling stuff, if they're hanging towards bait or a treetop or a stump or whatever is two or three times you pulled that whole school 50 feet away from the structure, you got to come back. They're not going to, they're not going to school back up to where you need them to. Um, so that's my fluke stuff. Um, or kind of my, my major swim bait stuff. I'll save my sneaky bit for, for last, but the next one is a drop shot bait. If you don't have drop shot tied on on Smith Mountain, I feel bad for you. Um, it's the best way to catch size numbers, fill a limit. Like it's just the best way to do it here. Um, but a lot of the guys are still going to throw standard robo worms or magic worms or or even go like you know power shot and stuff like that. I am going the other route, um, and I am going with the old bomb shot here. Super, super fun bait. Um, this is again, open water. This isn't going to be brush, uh, you know, fishing. This isn't going to be using, uh, like a rebarb hook or anything like that. This is casting into a school that might be five, 10 feet off the bottom. Um, and just wiggling this thing like crazy. You guys can see how soft of a plastic that is. I mean, um, you're definitely going to use these, um, and go through them pretty good, but a lot of cool colors for missile on this thing. And it's just a good, shad imitating little three inch four inch sometimes I'll, I'll take this tail and actually cut it make a fork out of it mm. um, just to kind of give it a little bit more of a of a shad profile but just a nice color like that got a little bit of like blue and uh and chartreuse on there is just a killer little uh drop shot bait is that how you hook it is that threaded on there versus yeah so i just go threaded just to try to <laughs> save the bait a little bit more um Sorry. if you can you know, you can thread these octopus hooks are kind of like these drop shot hooks are kind of a little bit too bent in. Um, but you'll Tell see a lot of you. guys. Uh, I don't know. I just grabbed it out of like an extra bag. Yeah. I had. You'll see a lot of guys that'll rig it like this, like all the way through. Um, and then a lot of guys will do just in case there is stuff down there. Um, you know, they'll Texas rig it like that um, to where they think that that is going to texas rig it no but i always works. i always thought if you went over a log and it's open like this your hook's just going like yeah. that's the log like i don't know um i just rig it barely on there thread it kind of barely on there and that gives it enough motion or kind of a, enough of a free swing um enough of a free swing to kind of just be a good bait um and then that hook's exposed enough super easy fishing barely set the hook just lean lean into them um but that's a really good um, bottomish bait. I will say if you throw those other two baits and you're getting follows constantly, even with high fish in the water column, it's a good idea to come back and throw this into them. You, I will have fish follow baits t- 20 feet down to the bottom from being way high suspended. You would think a top water is the deal. Like they're set up perfectly on live scope. They're just not committing where you throw this thing and maybe you throw a quarter ounce drop shot weight. So it just, again, bombs past them. And you'll have eight or 10 fish out of the school go down to the bottom and it's it's literally just lift up and they're there. Um, so keep that in mind too as a try to try to present something a little bit different on them. Michael's got a good question here. How far below the bait do you place your drop shot weight? Generally this time of year, I'm going to do at least 12 inches. Um, so try to separate the bait from the weight a little bit. And then what's actually nice is when you separate it. So let's say you went to 18 inches, really long leader on a drop shot is you can present a bait like this on suspended fish and they won't see that. Well, they'll probably see the weight, but it's not as much of a like obvious bait presentation to them is you can, you can take this and vertically drop on suspended bass um, and just kind of wiggle it in their face with a long enough leader. So I would say start with 12 inches, go up to 18 if you feel like you need to. Um, I throw like a six inch leader if I'm fishing, like definitely on the bottom or towards the bottom. Interesting stuff. That's really cool. And let's see. I'm going to get some other questions going while you get yep. your other bits. Where'd the other one go? Oh, Scott Bauer. How do you feel about the GSM buying Dobbins? Good question, my man. Hope you're doing good, Scott. Um, so 
I've been in contact, I mean, with my like regular Dobbins guys, just kind of talking like, hey, how's things going? Just checking in. Um, seems like it's going to be a good partnership. Uh, I mean, Gary deserves to retire. Um, dude put in his work and, and did what he needed to do. Um, we'll see if there's kind of some connection with, with other brands that maybe I can get involved with, which would be sweet. Um, but as far as like the Dobbins family and what I can tell, I don't think you guys are going to run into any like customer service issues or quality issues or anything like that. I really think it's just kind of handing over the, handing over the, the reins to GSM on a, you know, I don't know, conglomerate side. Um, but I feel like they're doing, they're doing good work with the other brands. Yamamoto's got rebranded, new baits coming out. Um, you know, Bill Lewis has new baits coming out. It's, it feels like they're going to stay innovative and at least try to try to keep things going. So we'll see. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they start pulling people off of like discounts or pro staff or stuff like that, but that's just, that's normal. That's like how that's monopolies work, of, guys. Yeah, that's just part of um, part of the process of of how that's working or how that how that works, and and that's just part of the game and and how it works. So I'm excited. We'll we'll see. I would love to get uh, be able to latch on and somehow get 500 packs of Senkos. Let's see, Tony uh, four five zero Billy. You have you ever thrown a Berkeley saltwater four inch unrigged cull shad with a five? This is an oddly specific question, Tony. <laughs> with a five aught one fourth ounce weighted hook at Smith Mountain Lake. I have not, but let's um, <laughs> let's pull this up here. Um, a saltwater cull shad. I, I assume it's it. a paddle tail. I bet it is. Let me see if I can get my country internet to pull it up. Salt water, Berkeley. There we go. You might have to share it. My internet's out. I got you. Or it is acting out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can answer no because I don't even know what it is. Yeah. Let's so is see. it just like the new coal shad? Interesting. Okay. Neat color patterns. Um, I have not, and that's interesting. They're in a four inch because is the pre-rigged coal shad for like bass come unrigged? Hmm. The world may never know. Did we just find a sneaky lure? We might have just found a sneaky lure that we just shared with the world. Uh, let's see, soft baits. Categories. What was that guy's name again? Tony. Yeah, so four five Tony, zero. Yeah, I would I would say would work just as good as as the the fluke deal at least on dragging a, a swim bait on the bottom. So I do I do the same thing with the six inch mag draft. Um, like if I'm if I'm going big bait fishing, um, I'll definitely do a, a six inch mag on just like a like a open hook or or I'll do kind of what you're talking about and put like a half ounce weight on the front um, and a big hook um, like a six odd seven odd. But I have not, uh, I actually haven't even thrown the coal shad. Um, I think I got one in the garage, but um, yeah, I don't know. Good idea. Looks like a sweet bait. With the blue back herring in the lake, are you seeing that they're a little bit smaller or, or what, what size Bigger. are they generally speaking? They're like five inches. They're like, okay. well, maybe fives on the big side. I'd say four to four and a half. Okay. Um, so they're not like Murray size, those six to seven. No, no, I don't think so. Not yet. Um, uh, you know, a big thing with the blue back that a lot of guys need to, to realize is the shape's different. They're, they're long and skinny, um, and they move very, yeah. yeah, it's very S shaped, like with snake -like. swimmer, like the Sabeel swimmer and the, and the Spro sashimi or whatever that bait is, that is extremely accurate with what a blue back running for its life looks like. I, I remember uh, when we fished college tournaments and you go down to any tackle shop near Murray or Hartwell and it was just Sabeel or sub whatever Sabal just all yep. over the place down there. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so that's, again, that's why a fluke shines, yep. um, is it's got that, you know, if you put the right hook in it, that's got enough tail movement. Um, and you can soften up your flukes too and boil your flukes for a little bit and they will be even more. Um, but that weird S kick is extremely important. 
Um, and honestly, that'll that'll probably lead into this the sneaky bait. So oh. um, why don't I do why don't I do something funny? Here comes a straight up Minnesota. Da, 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 da. Mr. Twister, Jesus, that is a blast from the past. Blast from the past, still catches bass. Um, all right, so talking blueback and that that quick kick, that S kick, that's like, oh my god, got to get away, is a Mr. Twister rigged weightless, um, reeled right under the surface is a crazy way to get really finicky schooling bass to bite. Um, this is. Uh, like I mentioned my spinning rods, this is like a seven foot zero power. Like it feels like a damn panfish rod, um, type of approach. Or I throw this on a 722 ecstasy, like a super expensive, like really nice rod. Um, because you cannot whip this thing insanely far, but it's very, very, uh, unique presentation for these fish. So I don't even remember where or who taught me this, but, um, I just take a one out rebarb. So this is a drop shot hook. It's got a little keeper on the on the end right there. Um, and basically, it doesn't matter which way. I actually like to go in backwards to give this thing a little bit more kick. Um, but you're just going to rig, thread it all the way on right to where the, the ribbed piece ends and the, uh, and the tail begins up on the keeper right there. And literally just bop bomb it whip it as you know you might have to go down to a six pound line an eight pound braid like this is a really 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 finessey deal but this reeled at the right speed at the top looks just like a uh, a blueback swimming away um and it's hmm. just a really really unique way to do it um are, are you slow rolling that without a weight like how you can't burn it too hard right you can, um, and with the hook being exposed, I don't really care if the hook's up or down or to the side. I don't really okay. care. You're just trying to get a biological response um, to them chasing bluebacks right under the surface. Mm. And so what it really is, is it's really the tail. Like to go back to Tony's thing with saltwater, I have these out there that are longer. Um, they're not Mr. Twisters. They're like a saltwater deal that I picked up yeah. in like Nags Head like eight years ago where they're like five inch Mr. Twisters, but the, the bottom four inches is tail. And it's that same thing that it's just, it's so kicky, um, coming through the water column that this can definitely get those finicky bass that are just following top waters all day, following, following the swim bait, um, and following the fluke. So that's my little sneaky giveaway that's this cool. time is, uh, this super, super weird, uh, Mr. Twister deal. So I expect Mr. Twister stock to go up quite a bit. Yeah, like grub, man. I remember before swim baits became a thing for smallmouth up, up in smallmouth country where we are. That's what you do. You'd swim a grub. Like you yep. didn't have three inch swim baits. You could yep. just pull off the shelf. Um, every single time my father comes here, he says, just give me a jig head and a Mr. Twister. <laughs> Doesn't matter what time of year it is. He says I can catch bass. I mean, he's a, he's a walleye guy, but he can catch bass. And he does, dude. Smith, when he comes to visit here, if I give him a jig head and a Mr. Twister, he will catch a bass on it. Um, so it just shows that like, you know, it's just a good, it's been a bait for a hundred years. And so, it'll still catch them, right? It'll still catch them, dude. Uh, let's see. We got a couple of questions here. Let's see. We got, I'm not going to even say that name. You know who you are. I think I missed this part. Do you want more or less tail action on your swim baits in the summer? Yep. Just, just kind of, kind of handled it, uh, what is it? Chuck in the truck. The, yeah. Chuck in the truck. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, hundred percent dude. You want motion, you want movement and you want speed. That's the most important part to summertime fishing. Um, again, we did, we didn't even talk about the night fishing. We can jump into that for a second, but, um, this is the time of year where you can go as you can reel as fast as possible they will still bite it. You can work your top water. You should work your top water as fast as humanly possible to get those reaction bites because that is how they're chasing bait. They're, you will never be faster than a bass can grab your bait. It just is not possible. That's 100% accurate. Uh, we got B. Callis Jr. Uh, what drop shot weight and size? Yep. I use, uh, I actually do lead weights uh, just because with guiding, they, they, I would burn through all of my life savings on tungsten. Um, so I just pour my own. 
Eighth ounce, probably 80% of the time. Quarter ounce, if I want that really fast drop or I'm fishing crazy deep or maybe I'm fishing vertically. Um, and then maybe I have a couple like giant three eighths in there, maybe um, for power shotting. But eighth ounce, most of the time, I feel like it's the most natural fall um, for a drop shot. Because again, yeah. fish will follow baits to the bottom and it's just a, it's a natural fall that they like. Um, and then I do a cylinder weight. 95% of the time, the teardrops and the the round balls, they still get stuck in the rocks. I just don't even really care to pour yeah. two of the same size at this point. And guys, in my personal opinion, tungsten is the biggest overrated crap ever put on the market because <laughs> I think it has a a difference, but a $5 a weight difference, no effing way. Nope. It's not. I, I, I would say maybe on a jig because yeah. the head size yeah. is smaller maybe that's the benefit but drop shot shaky head you know those types of things may i don't know i wouldn't even say to Miki, dude i mean with live scope and having a really good rod you don't that's where i put the money yeah i would i would agree i would put the money into the rod now what about the now the tungsten nail weights i don't because they're smaller to put in your smaller baits potentially i could see yeah. an argument there but yeah yeah yeah, for me, it would just be jig. It would just be jig size. You can get away with a half ounce, like really small, like micro -y jig size type of type of deal. Then that's the way to go. Let's see. We got Michael again. Night bass fishing baits. All right. This could be a whole nother video, too. I am not an expert on this. I will definitely say that. Um, but from my experience and just talking to guys and, and, and dudes that really night fish 100%. You have to have a worm on your on your deck at all times. Texas rigged old monster is probably the staple. Um, G tail ringers. Um, uh, I think Sixth Sense has a decent a decent big worm. I actually throw. I have a couple of worms in the garage that are out of a company out of California that are thirteen inches. Um, I don't know what the hell they think a worm is falling through the brush piles in pitch dark. I have no idea. Um, but that is the most success I have had has been on a worm. Uh, and honestly, the darker, the better, which is also seems very weird. Um, I guess maybe it's creating more of a shadow, whatever the case may be, but black grape shad, um, something in, in those kind of colors is, is good. Um, top water early in the year when the shad spawns going on, it's hard to beat a thunder stick, Mikey. Uh, missile baits got that the the switch um you know there's a few other kind of like proppy style baits that you can do but a big worm and oversized jig is another one three quarter ounce like a big jig big trailer make a jig like half the size of your hand actually i've i have not gotten any of them from missile um oh, the, the lobster jig could maybe maybe that could be a deal where you're literally throwing a you know, dinner sized plate jig. We have them in Smith mountain, dude. I've seen jigs as big as my hand like that. When he came out with that, I literally was like, dude, I, I have actually seen crawdads similar size at Smith mountain. They look like baby lobsters. Um, so, it's so weird that the worm has been consistent for 200 years at now, there's no other bait ever. I think has been as consistent as that niche of night fishing and a worm. Yep. Yeah. I just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I do variations on it that I think maybe would make a difference. So like your weight size is important. I throw a wobble head at night a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I want that ticking. St that's more like on the rock veins and stuff like that. Um, the brush it's, it's pretty straightforward, man. 20, 22 pound line, like, uh, seven, six heavy, just jack them. Um, but the, the night fishing stuff, I've also had buddies, that literally tell me they go throw a drop shot at night in two feet of water when they're up chasing shad, when they won't hit a top water, you know, or, or this time of year now that the shad spawns kind of dying out that they throw a drop shot at night, dude. And they're catching six pounders, um, Jeez. right off the banks where the shad are spawning, which they're there there. You can see them on live scope. You can see, you can see everything that's going on. Um, that's going on with those fish up there. Sometimes they just don't want to chase the top water or the worm, but, um, yeah, those are, those are kind of the night baits, Carolina rigs a lot. Um, you know, a lot of guys are throwing big creature baits and stuff like that, but you're throwing big baits, you're throwing dark colors. Um, a, 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 not a trick, but what I was taught was you are fishing very slowly. 
because it's going to take them longer to use their lateral line to see it. So like um, a good trick is if you're thrown into a brush pile, you are lifting up and banging into that limb 20 times before something comes up and grabs it. Um, I will say the fun side of night fishing is when you do get a worm bite, they are ripping it out of your, your hand. Like hmm. you will be sore after a good night of night fishing um, because the bites are so stupid obvious um, that it's, it's pretty impressive how aggressive a fish can be at 25 feet um, in a brush pile to knocks to have your line jump that much in the pitch dark. Damn. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's fun when you can get on them. Um, I think my biggest night fish I caught was on a worm was almost seven. Um, yeah. And just straight up, like just ripped it out of your arm, dude. Dude, that's absolutely, that's, that's fun. Uh, yeah. Kyle, I, with an interesting question here, have you ever heard any crazy sounds in the middle of the night or was it anyone that you ran over? Human sounds or animal sounds? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not really. Um, lots of owls at Smith mountain, um, which is, which is pretty cool. I'm, I'm an owl guy. I like owls. Um, not really rustling. Most stuff's kind of asleep. You definitely have your people like, um, talking late at night, which is pretty funny because for anybody that fishes a lot or spends time on the water, we could talk at this length and someone a half mile away could hear this whole conversation or at this volume. Um, so you'll have people sitting at campfires at one, two in the morning talking about just super raunchy stuff. Um, and like you can hear them and they're literally on the other side of the lake enjoying their campfire and you can hear them like you're sitting at the campfire with them. So Kyle, you need to come on the show. I've just heard some stories by the dam. Yeah. Ooh, I, I, I need to hear spooky. some of these stories. Yeah. I've heard some big cats and stuff when I did float trips on the South Fork of the Shenandoah as a kid at Ugh. night for smallmouth yeah. because they will smoke a chatterbait at night uh on the river and you'll hear some wildlife man it'll make you pucker yeah what is the biggest law I, I don't think i've asked you this what's the biggest one you've ever caught out of smith 821 821 damn yep in a tournament it was awesome i caught a four and a half pounder off of a rock and i made it the next cast and caught a 821 off the same rock dude yep. super sweet <laughs> you can't really beat that yep she bent or she broke both the crankbait hooks and she only had one hook outside of her lower lower jaw that stayed in so, will doesn't like when i throw those hooks but <laughs> too bad uh let's see uh sounds like lake champlain throwing a big spook and small coming up out of 20 feet of water to eat them yep 100 percent, josh it's it's mentally hard to think that they would do that because you're like ah, those fish are way deep i'm gonna pick up a swim bait you do it that's just what you would do um, but especially smallies will definitely come out of that, um, that type of water to get it. And, and going back to what I said earlier about the, the, the wake from the boats and stuff, if it's like windy choppy, like windy choppy is different than wake choppy because wake, you can kind of like get in between the waves or like, it's, you know, not as like white cappy. Um, I'll still throw a big walking bait in pretty good chop from wakeboard boats on a Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I can still get them to see it and come up. Um, it just, it's just that bait being there. And those, those fish, I will say are under pressured. Hmm. Dude, that's interesting. All right, guys, we got a couple more questions here. Cause we'll be wrapping it up tonight. Uh, we've got a 10.5 inch old monster. Oh, Black yeah, is the juice at night. Also striking rodent, California yeah. crawl, Texas rig. Oof. Yeah, I have heard the rodent is a good night bait for sure. That's not I get into is a couple more night fishing trips just to kind of experiment with that, try some different things. The jitterbug, that was another thing growing up that people threw. Oh, yeah. And that has that, that really hasn't made a comeback in tournaments either. That just feel like it should be coming back. It definitely can still work. Oh yeah. Like it's the same concept as all the eye wings and like um you like the super high end Japanese stuff. And then it's very similar. I mean, it's not as it's not as subtle as like the the thunderstick type of uh, baits, mm -hmm. but it's definitely got that shad pushy water kind of deal. Yes. So, are we buying the patent to the jitterbug? Did we just decide that? I might just buy the patent to the jitterbug because I, I it, it's it's what's happening. Like you see this in fashion and movies. Like what is it? every twenty years it comes back into style, and I think in fishing that's what's going to happen because Japan can't just be the only place that pumps out new ideas. Sure. Just put a rat tail on the back of it, dude. It'll be a new bait. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So uh, what do you got coming up? Anything new? So 
baby's baby's good for anybody that uh that knows that that happened baby's good i know i look tired as hell um but i'm actually i'm actually pretty good she's super happy she's sleeping really good um taylor taylor's doing good guiding guiding is picking up but i, I definitely will say i definitely had a slower um slower may and june than i've had i think a lot of people you know covid drew people local um, and I think now that we're out of that enough, I think a lot of people started going back to the beach just to, just to change it up. And then we really had a weird, um, I was just talking to a buddy about it. This isn't necessarily fishing related, but more like just how the world works of a lot of the Airbnbs at Smith mountain doubled their occupancy rate or like raised it way too high to where we have houses that are for rent here that are the same price as the keys. And it's like, why the hell would you come to Smith Mountain? Um, I know it's beautiful here, but I'm not going to pay the same amount for a rental as I would for the keys. Um, so I don't know, just kind of having a little bit weird of a, of a start of the year, but I'm slammed for the next like 25 days. I'm, I'm pretty much going to be out there every day or so. Since you're into this, this part of the industry too, mm -hmm. will lake houses in Smith and specifically like Anna price a lot of people out of the market in 10 years? I mean, I, know, dude, I wasn't, I wasn't here in 2008, but I heard 2008 was pretty crushing here where you had a lot of people selling million dollar houses for 600,000 bucks. Um, so I don't know that that big of a swing would ever happen again. But if there was, I mean, nobody knows this on the real estate side is, you know, it, it's like a, it's almost the term would be called a reverse crash, which is they drop rates. And now what's everybody going to do? Cause now the market's going to be flooded with buyers. Mm -hmm. You think a homeowner is going to drop their price. Mm -hmm. They're going to raise their price. Um, so it's called a reverse crash, which that could happen. Um, but at some point that's going to have to equalize as well. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's definitely been funky. Um, I mean, I've done a few real estate deals this year. Um, already, but you know, that's the upper echelon of, of income earners. And it's not really, they don't really care about the difference between a couple hundred thousand bucks, which is weird to say, but, um, <laughs> there's just some people like that. Um, so we'll see, um, they're building a ton. I will say that, um, a lot of lots got sold. I think Smith mountain is going to look pretty different in the next five years. Um, as far as they sold off a lot in bull run, which is kind of one of the last undeveloped pockets and then they sold a decent chunk of the lower end of the mountain um so there'll definitely be some uh, there'll definitely be some new houses and docks in some unique areas will it ever look like lake norman god i hope not um <laughs> yeah like i just got a text before we started about lake traffic somebody was saying like hey is it worth coming up yet is the lake traffic that bad like what should i do i actually don't think it's that bad um as of yet you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't balls to the wall run this time of year. Anyways, I'm going 45, yeah. um, and I'm slowing down for big wakes usually. Um, so I don't think it's that bad in a 20 foot bass boat. I wouldn't come out in a 16 foot boat. Um, maybe 17 is questionable. 18 is going to be annoying, but if you're in a 19 or 20 foot boat, it's, it's not that bad right now even on Saturdays and Sundays. And if you decide you want to fish from 5.30 to 11.30, it's really not that bad, like at all. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully hopefully it picks up a little bit. It's election year too. Like it's always a weird year. Mm -hmm. I can look at it through our wedding business, through real estate, through, through every business I've ever started. Election years are always years where there's people just kind of holding off on spending money. So, if you wanted to go down to fish, when is the best time to, to get an Airbnb or a place to, to check out the lake? I would try either early a like April time, um, because you'll have some restaurants. Well, I, I would say late April, May, cause you'll have restaurants that'll start opening a little bit just to kind of get the cobwebs off. Or I would try September when most people go back to school, hmm. September, probably more just because it's still warm. Like we can still have 80 degree days in September. Most of the restaurants will still be open. You can still rent a boat pretty easy. Um, water's warm enough to swim in. So yeah, if you can let the kids get back into, uh, into school for most states, um, like I don't know Maryland or PA when they go back, but all of these states seem to be like, uh, like a week or two apart. 
Um, so that kind of probably makes it easy, but yeah, I would, I would try September time fishing might be a little tough, but that would be a good time to at least come check the lake out. Hmm. Right on, right on. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered yet to make sure that we get everything that's going on in your fascinating we'll, life? We'll talk about the old paddleboard company. I don't think I've really talked to anybody about it. Uh, a couple guys, um, but uh, we don't really have a social presence or anything like that, but a, a really exciting paddleboard uh, endeavor that I'm uh, launching here in August with one of my good buddies that we've been working on for two years, which is crazy to say. Um, like we, we were just joking this morning about it because our, our apps getting wrapped up is uh, uh, if anybody knows like the four square, I think it's a square, but it's like the squares of going through learning something new. And the second one is um, Valley of Despair is what we called it, which is like it feels like nothing is working and it's going nowhere. And uh, we think we are finally out of the Valley of Despair, which turns into uh, informed optimism. So we feel like we are ready to rock and roll. So we're pretty pretty pumped about it and I'll have a lot more info about it. We can, we can talk about, um, we can talk about on the next one when we do one. Right on. As always guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about because this is a Monday night live stream. It'll be going uh, private at about 10 o'clock tonight. That's just because I'm going to be polishing it up and re putting it out there tomorrow morning around 4 a.m. So it'll be available on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Amazon radio, and also YouTube. If you'd like to, we're only five Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. So head on over there and do that. Eventually we are going to be starting that nonprofit when we get enough Patreon supporters. So we can start doing some F1 stocking and some other likes that really also need a little loving on the side like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia and shallow water fishing adventures baits online located in mount airy maryland if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will